Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India You know this is the class on review and uh, strength of materials is a subject where experimental information forms the basis for the development. You know with the modern multimedia facility we are in a position to integrate the experimental information along with theoretical development. So, you have seen thought experiment, actual experiment all along the course. Okay. And even though we discuss several other things as part of the course, you should keep track that we confine our mathematical development only to slender members. You should never lose track of it. And a slender member in general can transmit uh, three forces and three moments. And if you have a force like this, you call that as a shear force. And then if you have a moment like this, you call this as a bending moment. Now, you know what is the kind of distribution that you have uh, in the member and the values of the magnitude of shear force bending moment and also the bending moment in the other plane. All that you get from your course on rigid body mechanics. If we want to find out how this cross section develops a resistance for supporting this shear force or a bending moment, we have to come to deformable solids and then find out what the variation is. And we have also seen that you can have a shear force in this direction and uh, you, you can have an axial force and we have also done uh, twisting and you essentially do in your rigid body mechanics a shear force diagram, bending moment diagram, axial force diagram or twisting moment diagram. All this is to find out along the length of the member which cross section is transmitting the maximum of these values and which cross section is the worst affected. So, for that cross section you have to find out the stresses and then look at the theories of failure and find out whether the cross section that you have decided or the material that you have chosen can bear this. And you know to recognize that a slender member will transmit um, force and a moment even though they have not considered all these uh, six components, the basic idea goes to the credit of Bernoulli and Leibniz, they are all around uh, 1700. Okay. And you know we ask the question what is the typical variation of stress in these members and even before I do the mathematical development, I have shown by inference by looking at the photoelastic fringes when I have this color is very constant over the width. We said that this is transmitting a uniform uh, force, okay, the resistance is uniform and the moment you come to bending, you have fringes which are of equidistance and we said that it is uh, having a linear variation and before we looked at bending we saw the torsion. We found that the shear stress is varying linearly over this section that is very important see this surface is free and uh, the moment you come to bending we also find that uh, stress is varying linearly. For all these three problems, we have looked at uniform cross section. It is transmitting only one of them. If it is transmitting axial force, it is transmitting only axial force. If it is transmitting twisting moment, it will transmit on a shaft of constant cross section. And then for a beam, we have also looked at among the several ways of beam bending, we carefully chose the beam under pure bending so that it transmits only the bending moment. And we have also developed certain important relations. Okay. You have this as a torsion formula. So, you have 
now the knowledge what is mt by ip equal to tau z theta by r equal to g phi by l this is valid for a constant bending moment and a constant value of the cross section okay so similarly you also know the flexure formula in fact your next course on uh, design of machine elements can be done only with these two expressions fine and once you look at the axially loaded member the celebrated uh, relationship is what is the extension delta equal to pl by ae these are all celebrated expressions you need to remember them you will not have time to derive this from first principles and you know we have effectively used this when we wanted to analyze the hoop so delta equal to pl by e is a very very famous expression and we have been able to do this with important idealizations we have said it is small deformation the moment i say small deformation we imply apply the equilibrium requirements to the undeformed configuration that's very very important material is homogeneous elastic property same at every point that is why i have shown multiple points shown it is homogeneous properties are uh, same at every point and you understand this with a contrasting example if i have a concrete uh, cylinder it is heterogeneous if you go and see how they mix concrete you will know they will have aggregates they will have cement they will have sand it's it cannot be homogeneous okay because we find it difficult to handle a heterogeneous material we also idealize it as homogeneous and i have said with modern developments in experimental analysis with rapid prototyping and uh, three dimensional photoelastic analysis you can analyze even a heterogeneous material maybe come out with better material models and we have also made a very interesting and uh, important idealization material is isotropic elastic property same along any direction i have repeatedly said extrusion a simple metal uh, processing uh, process it introduces uh, alignment of the grains so it disturbs whether it is being isotropic or uh, uh, to an extent orthotropic okay but we close our eyes and then say that is it's easy for me to develop the mathematics if i consider this as isotropic and maybe do a tension test by taking the specimen along the fiber direction where the grain is elongated use that as a property for predicting its failure so we have found out a way to wriggle out in practical situations and another very important aspect is we have made a very very fundamental and important idealization material is an elastic continuum otherwise you cannot say delta x tends to zero you cannot do that mathematical step and in reality you have uh, voids you have cracks all that is taken care of in another development of mechanics called fracture mechanics okay so idealizations are very very important without idealization we will not be in a position to do and in order to do all this we started with a very simple experiment of taking a material and then elongating it with different cross sections and we plotted the load deflection you are getting one graph for each of this material okay and even though this is an observation done by robert hook the fundamental convenience of this is by looking at a spring he was able to visualize that all the engineering materials also have elongation because you have to graduate from rigid body mechanics to deformable solids so from an ideological point of view this thinking was very very crucial but plotting this load versus deflection and absent this as linear was also very important but it is inadequate okay because when i have to characterize a material i have to have thousands of tests in fact infinite number of tests we may have to do which is impractical you will have to have minimum number of tests so that you can characterize the material and we have also looked at that credit was given to bernoulli and for the same uh, three different cross sections if you plot the graphs differently by plotting change in length divided by original length and uh, plotting uh, force divided by area 
for all these three different cross sections, you had only one graph. And you should also understand that this is restricted to only 0.1 percent of original length. If you have really taken a material and done a tension test, you want to mathematically express it for the complete range, strength of material would not have progressed. You have to look at from the practical point of view that our operating conditions require we apply very small load. I cannot live in the comfort of rigid body mechanics. I have to bring in deformation. So, that is the first baby step bring in small deformation. You could solve a variety of simple problems. And you should also appreciate a simple change like this, it took his entire lifetime, okay, toward the, this was his final paper, Bernoulli, he is also credited with the beam theory, fine. So, some of these developments look very simple now, but they are very difficult and you have to look at people have burnt their fingers, looked at practical uh, situation, looked at nature. And, uh, and you need to have mathematics also develop. So, things have happened uh, in different points in time, okay. And when they were uh, doing this uh, um, development of strength of materials, photolysis was not available to them. It was also happening parallelly. It became very prominent only in the 1930s, okay. Now, you have the advantage, I have used photoelasticity as a vehicle to appreciate various concepts through inference. And in order to develop the mathematics, we also developed new mathematical entities. We developed what is known as a stress vector. That stems from the fact that when I break the chalk, the chalk breaks at different planes as if chalk is intelligent. Depending on the load applied, failure is on different planes. So, what happens on a particular plane is very, very important and fundamental. And then uh, we took a point and a small area surrounding this point, that is the definition, okay. And uh, we found uh, there could be a resultant force. And following what we have looked at uh, in Robert Hooke's experiment and also the following improvement by Bernoulli, we defined a quantity force divided by area for the small uh, area around it in the limit delta i a tends to 0. So, we coined a new symbol T cap 1. When I say 1, it is referring the plane 1, plane is defined by outward normal. And then it is desirable that you put a vectorial symbol, but it may be difficult to write. So, we also said that the moment I put a cap, you understand that this is a vector. If I have any subscripts, then you look at this as component, easy for us to handle while writing the equations. And the definition is the stretch vector acting on plane 1 is limit delta a tends to 0, delta t 1 divided by delta a, okay. And uh, you know you have this material because I, we have assumed this as an elastic continuum and then you have equal and opposite forces happening. So, this was very fundamental for you to develop all the related concepts. And we said that you have to get uh, stress vector on all the comp uh, infinite planes passing through the point of interest, only then this is uh, complete, okay. And we have also said uh, I will cut a special plane which has uh, outward normal as uh, coinciding with the x direction and we have defined new components sigma x x. When I say sigma, it is denoting a normal stress you have two subscripts, the first subscript refers to the plane on which it is acting, the second subscript refers to the direction in which it is acting. And uh, you know in uh, books, they may also call all of this as tau. You have a special symbol, when I put sigma, it is always denoting a normal stress. And when I have tau, this denotes a shear uh, uh, stress acting on the surface. So, you have the plane and the direction. And at this stage, it appears as if it is too complicated, you need to get infinite number of quantities. And Cauchy showed that it is enough that you get this stress vector on any three mutually perpendicular planes, T x, T y and T z if you get, 
you can get stress factor on any of the possible infinite planes passing through the point of interest. Okay, that was the very important mathematical development. And uh, you know, you have these components represented uh, in a cube. And I have also said this is for representation purpose. The cube has zero dimensions. Okay, and you should know how to write these quantities. And we have also discussed on a positive plane positive direction is positive on a negative plane negative direction is positive and this goes to the credit of coulomb and i have also summarized that uh, this has zero dimension okay it is a representation what happens at a point of interest and uh, so, formalized stress tensor in 1822. So, we are in the 200th year, okay. We are learning this course. And the Cauchy's formula takes a tetrahedron and then in the limit shrink it to 0. And we have developed it by invoking the equilibrium conditions. In fact, we have got this is with respect to this column, but we wrote it like this because it is easy for me to write it in a matrix form. And we have utilized the concept of equality of cross shears to write this. See, in uh, strength of materials, it is very difficult to develop the subject without looking at what is the future development, fine, because it is not in a, a sequence. Certain concepts have to be introduced even before we derive and prove it, okay. But we have definitely shown by looking at the moment equilibrium that you have tau x y equal to tau y x. So, the idea is for any plane of interest, I can find out the stress vector. To do this, you get this and this you call this as a stress tensor. Okay. Stress tensor is a consequence of our requirement to find out stress vector. And stress vector is the one which is going to help you why the chalk fails at different planes. Fine. And uh, then we also recognize that stress tensor is a tensor of rank 2 and all that. And you know, normal stress was something uh, easier to perceive. So, people were able to understand what is normal stress, which we have looked at from a simple tension specimen. And we have also defined a force divided by area as this value. And I have always emphasized in the mathematical development, we idealize the deformation picture and directly evaluate the component. It will appear only like a number, but you should have the practice how to recognize that this is a tensorial quantity, always write it in a matrix like this. That is a training because I have this as a y axis, I have f by a as the component which is a sigma y component here. And uh, you know, people found it difficult to appreciate what is shear. And one simple experiment is you punch it. So, you have this outer surface. Okay. So, I have uh, force divided by area will give you this uh, shear. And uh, this was introduced by Parent in 1713. And we have also seen it was extensively used by Coulomb. Okay. Developed the idea further. And when you have this basic uh, stress tensor, I will have this shear component shown in the diagonal elements. Like I have shown this f by a here, area definition is different. This is the area contributing to the resistance of axial force and the complete area forming the perimeter is forming the area resisting the shear. The idea of what is shear, you can very well comprehend by this punching experiment. And we have also looked at how do I represent this graphically because in the early days graphical information was very, very strong. People did not have calculators and computers. So, they were making assessment based on graphical appreciation. And one of the simplest way to represent them is a polar plot. And we have seen uh, what is a polar plot for normal and uh, shear stress. You have the expression F A by sin square theta and you have this for each of the planes, how the normal stress is plotted. It looks very beautiful, okay, but it is difficult to draw, fine. 
and the shear stress appears like a beautiful butterfly and uh, you can also correlate with respect to the different planes. So, this is one simple way of doing it. Even for a simple axial uh, load, you have such beautiful patterns, but later on we realize that the stress state can be beautifully and conveniently represented in the form of a circle that we call it as a Mohr circle. And uh, in the development, we have also discussed a very important uh, principle which is usually uh, talked in the sideline in books. So, you have to appreciate what is the Sinvenon principle. If I apply an axial load, I can apply it by either a single force or two forces or three forces or even an uniform loading if I am capable of uh, having a grip and pulling it. So, when I go from this to this, I am going more and more uniform. So, what happens is this is a photoelastic fringe pattern. So, when I apply the load, you find that becomes a uniform color only at distances away from the load application points and this points get shifted when I make the load more and more similar to the anticipated distribution. So, what the sign Vinan principle says is if the applied load is statically equivalent away from the point of loading your uh, computation will match the theoretical conjecture. Okay? And you do not have uh, this readily available uh, in books with photoelasticity we are in a better position to show. So, it takes some distance. So, it becomes finite only when it is dis distributed three times the resultant is same as this force never forget that. Okay. It is a very very important principle that we have utilized it now even in your future courses you will utilize this same Vinan's principle. And uh, you know, I have also emphasized that uh, you should have a smooth transition from mathematics to engineering. So, when I say that uh, stresses are functions of x, y and z, suppose I say for discussion purpose it is a function of x and y for me to write simple diagrams. When I say sigma x in this uh, phase, it will vary as sigma x plus dou sigma x by dou x delta x when I move by delta x when I move by delta y, I will have this, but when I move by delta x and delta y, I will have uh, this kind of variation, fine. But you know, product of small quantities is much smaller, fine. So, when I replace this by an average that is, that is acting on this phase, I can represent it like this and I can also take this as an average and represent it like this. Even though in reality this is what happens on this phase and this phase, since our interest is to find out the equilibrium along the direction, it is convenient if you drop off these two terms which is not going to affect your uh, mathematics in any form. This is easier to write and this is how we wrote it for all the other directions when we had all the stress components acting and we did uh, uh, develop uh, equilibrium conditions. And the equilibrium conditions uh, appeared as uh, differential equations mainly because this is a deformable solid. So, I can have infinite possibilities of subsystems and if I solve the differential equation, the equilibrium condition is completely satisfied. So, I have this as a forced equilibrium condition and this is the moment equilibrium condition and the moment equilibrium condition established equality of cross shears. This property we have used already while writing the Cauchy's formula for finding out the stress vector. Okay. Some back and forth is unavoidable and uh, you know stress is a tensor, it is not a vector. Okay. So, if I have to find out uh, stress tensor with respect to x prime y prime, initially I will have to get the stress vector on plane x prime and y prime that is easily achieved by your uh, Cauchy's formula. Okay. So, by using Cauchy's formula you get this vector then transform this vector by vectorial transformation. So, you have to do that transformation two times okay. and uh, we have this stress vector uh, T x uh, prime and uh, this is simply your uh, rotation matrix. Rest of it is mathematics is simple, you should write the rotation matrix properly okay. and this is how you have done the vector uh, 
I mean tensorial transformation. The second stage is a vector transformation. Okay, and when you do this, you get long expressions. And I have also said how to get these without going through matrix multiplication, just by indical notation. How to write this is very very convenient. You don't have to remember, provided you write the rotation matrix uh, very carefully. The question is whether you have to have minus sin theta here or minus sin theta there. That is where the confusion will come. So, if you simply take a x y axis and x prime y prime axis, take a point and you find that uh, x prime is longer, so it will be positive and y prime is shorter, so it will have negative. That is one way of remembering it. Okay. And uh, it is very, very important. Once you have seen that stress transformation law, we have also looked at how this can be written in the form of a circle and uh, there is a procedure by which we adopted we have plotted a graph between sigma and tau and uh, this is the stress state given pictorially and i have the positive shear stress for the positive shear stress on the x plane we plot it downwards the reason is whatever the movement i do in the real plane i should do in the same way in the mohr's plane okay so, if I, rot if I rotate clockwise, I should rotate clockwise in the most circle also. If I rotate anticlockwise, I should rotate anticlockwise also. That is achieved only when I follow the sign uh, convention for plotting the x plane. Once you plot this plane, you can uh, join them and get the center and with this center you draw the circle and the circle contains the information of state of stress on all the possible infinite planes passing through the point of interest. Okay, at least in this plane and you can also find out uh, two points which have only normal stress there is no shear stress that is why they are called as principal planes and you can also identify two other points where you have shear reaches a maximum and I said in general when shear reaches a maximum you will also have normal stress if you go to only to pure shear stress state you will only have maximum shear stress you will not have any normal stress. Okay. And I have also said that I have taken a stress state so that this axis is not coming in between and uh, every point in the Mohr circle is representing a stress vector on a particular plane. Okay. And I have also shown it pictorially how the stress components change I can have a different values of normal stress and shear stress and as I come to the principal plane I have only normal stress I do not have any shear stress and likewise this goes and when I go to the maximum shear stress state I have shear is maximum but I still have some value of normal stress and likewise we understood every point so graphical representation was much more informative and convenient for you to comprehend the totality of what is the meaning of stress tensor? Okay. So, this is very convenient to see that. Then we have also looked at uh, what are uh, principal uh, stresses and the directions. You know, you can also coin this problem as a problem of an eigenvalue and eigenvector. And if I solve it as eigenvalue and eigenvector problem, I have no difficulty in finding out the associated directions because I have the eigenvectors as sigma 1 and sigma 2 and the eigenvalues as sigma 1 and sigma 2 and eigenvectors I can find out nx and ny for each of this value. If I substitute for sigma 1, I get the value for nx. I also get the value for ny and uh, my principal such direction is given as tan inverse ny by nx. Mathematically perfect and no ambiguity whether I have theta 1 is associated to sigma 1 or sigma 2 that ambiguity will not come. On the other hand for hand calculation we always uh, calculate sigma 1 and sigma 2 using this basic expression and once you calculate this you should find out and label which is sigma 1 which is sigma 2. We have understood that sigma 1 is always algebraically greater than sigma 2 and sigma 2 is always algebraically greater than sigma 3. That is how we have developed all our mathematics and also the failure theories. Failure theories use basically the principal stresses. And if you want to find out the orientation or the principal stress direction, 
from stress transformation law you get tau x prime y prime. By the definition of principal planes, we say that this is 0. So, this gives you uh, theta equal to 1 half of tan inverse 2 tau x y by sigma x minus sigma y. This is multi-valued uh, uh, problem. So, what you get as theta is not theta 1, what you get as theta uh, the second value is not theta 2. You will have to go to Mohr circle and then find out from the Mohr circle how you locate the theta 1 and theta 2, what is uh, acute angle and what is obtuse angle, only then you can fix. On the other hand, if you go by the Eigen value, Eigen uh, uh, vector root, you do not have this difficulty, fine, yeah. And we have also looked at there are invariants for a two dimensional representation of stress tensor, I 1 is sigma x s plus sigma y by I 2 is uh, nothing but the determinant of this matrix and uh, I have this uniaxial stress and if I plot uh, more circle, the more circle is like this. And I, you know, the same stress state can be represented in the tensorial matrix with non-zero numbers. The question is, when some stress state is given to you, how to investigate whether it is uniaxial or uh, uh, have a pure shear? These two you can identify from the invariants. And uh, I can represent this same stress state with non-zero values of sigma x, sigma y and tau x y, okay. I can uh, do it like this. So, if I calculate what is I 1 and I 2, I am in a position to do that. And when you have I 2 is 0, you have this as uniaxial stress, I 2 is 0 here. And when I 1 is 0, you say that this is a pure shear stress. It is a very powerful method of doing it, okay. So, you should understand uh, how to utilize this invariance and uh, you know when you do this as eigenvalue and eigenvector problem, eigenvectors are mutually perpendicular mathematically, fine. But people do not stop there, you know you have a very interesting experimental technique where you uh, coat the specimen with a brittle material. So, when the stresses increase, I have all said in the chalk experiment also, it is a brittle material, it fails by maximum uh, normal stress. So, the you indirectly get the direction or the principal stress direction and a very careful experiment was done by Professor Durelli and he has shown that you have two families, one is like circle, another is like a radial line. So, that established experimentally also that principal planes are mutually perpendicular, it is very, very useful information. And we have also looked at uh, shear cannot cross a free boundary, we have taken the problem of a plate with a hole, okay. And uh, you know this is this has a very high stress concentration and we have taken a point on the boundary and we have said that shear cannot cross a free boundary, okay. And uh, with this knowledge we have looked at and investigated what is happening uh, at a point which I am taking on this, we have taken two points, one is this point and another is this point and it is uh, not a loaded boundary. When the boundary is not loaded, you say it is a free surface and on a free surface what can exist, okay. And I have taken this uh, small segment, I have taken a point here and we have shown that what component of shear stress, okay cannot exist. On that basis, we have said that uh, you cannot have shear stress on that boundary, but you can definitely have a normal stress, okay. You can definitely have a normal stress and when I have this, the circle is easily representable by a polar coordinate. So, when I do it in a polar coordinate, what is this component of stress? This component of stress will be sigma theta theta. So, sigma theta theta will exist and you will not have sigma r and uh, tau r theta, they go to 0 and uh, that is what we have seen on this point and we have seen it on another point. You can also repeat it for any point on the boundary, okay. These are all very, very important concepts, you know books do not pay attention on all this. The concept of free surface is very essential when you want to write the boundary conditions. 
and when you want to solve the problem uh, numerically using uh, finite elements, you need to apply the boundary conditions correctly. And we have also taken a problem of a pressure vessel which is very very common and uh, you could do this from your uh, strength of materials knowledge itself and uh, we have got the expression as uh, F T as uh, P R B and when you divide by the area you get the stress and we call this a hoop stress P R by T and even by inference I have shown I have a thin uh, hoop subjected to internal pressure and this is a, um, a specimen subject to axial tension. You have constant color in this, you also have constant color seen in the hoop. So, even though the pressure vessel looks complicated, the stress transmitted by this is very simple, it is constant like what we have in a new axial tension which you had seen it by inference, fine. And I said that this is a closed pressure vessel. When I have a closed pressure vessel, I should also worry about what is the force in the other direction and we have taken a generic cross section and uh, this is uh, FL is equal to P by P pi R square okay? and I get sigma L as uh, uh, P R by 2 T and we have got uh, sigma hoop as P R by T and if you take any generic point, it is a true case of a two dimensional state of stress okay it is if you, because if you look at i1 and i2 they are not zero and i have this the very famous uh, stress tensor and i have also said when you are plotting the mohr circle you should also be careful if sigma 3 is zero its nuisance value has to be appreciated so if you draw the mohr circle for this and if you say that this is tau max then you are mistaken you are uh, um, metallic uh, can will fail even when you take your Pepsi. You do not want that to happen okay? because this is a ductile material, it fails by shear. So, you have to recognize the nuisance value of sigma 3 and the tau max is actually twice this value. So, you have to be very alert. So, one of the commonest example has both the principal stresses in the same direction. In all those cases, whether it is positive or negative, you should recognize the nuisance value of 0. If you have the theory of value differently, it gets automatically taken care of that we will see later. Right now, you know only maximum shear stress. So, if you use maximum shear stress, do not call this as maximum, the real maximum is double this value. That is what we have alerted from this. And you know, you must also have seen in many, many uh, when you go in the train, you will see spherical tanks all over the place. Have you noticed it? Why do they use spherical tank? That is also you are having a fluid at high pressure, fine. It is difficult to construct, but if you do mathematically, if you take any section, see here we have taken a section perpendicular to this, your area is uh, P pi r squared, area is pi r squared and the pressure is P, so the force is P pi r squared. So, on a sphere what happens? Anywhere you cut, you will have the, because it is a sphere, it is only pi r squared. So, everywhere here you have p r by t and p r by 2 t, there it is p r by 2 t and p r by 2 t. What is the advantage? Do you see that it merges into a point when you want to draw the Mohr circle? And you will have to worry only about this p r by 2 t and 0 and your maximum shear stress is one half of what is there in a cylindrical pressure vessel. So, the spherical pressure vessel difficult to construct, but experiences less load that is one advantage. Another advantage is you know they all uh, store uh, you know um, below the normal temperature fine, uh, I mean gases which are in liquid form. So, there sphere is one shape which has the least surface area for a given volume. So, heat transfer is less, when heat transfer is less the fluid will not get uh, pressurized. So, from all that practical consideration even though higher cost in construction spherical vessels are very widely used.
So, you have to look at the application and find out whether you want the cylindrical pressure vessel. Cylindrical pressure vessel also used, spherical pressure vessels also used. Okay. And we have also looked at if you want to reduce the um, weight of the pressure vessel, you can have this as fiber reinforced. And one of the um, important uh, knowledge that you have to gain is what should be the angle of this fiber. And uh, we have also uh, noticed that even in the tire, normally you ignore the tire, oh, after all it is a tire, cycle tire may be like that, but the same tire is also supporting a aircraft which is landing and take off. So, it is a very, very complex mechanics involved. They also have cross plies. And I showed a very interesting whether scientists are great or nature is far superior than scientists. You find a simple worm which is living under the sea has a body which has uh, uh, fibers which are oriented helically and uh, it manipulates this for its locomotion also. It bulges and then stretches, okay. And it that is so it, it does not have legs. You and I have legs and we can run. So, it has to move. So, it utilizes this. So, it is inspired from nature. So, nature is far superior than human intelligence, okay. And we moved on to strain and the important learning in strain is, uh, you know, if I apply strain in one direction, if I apply a load, strain is there in all the three directions, okay. And we have looked at uniform strain and we have also looked at non-uniform strain. So, you have the circle deforms into a circle when there is uniform strain and if there is a load is not uniform and in order to uh, get an appreciation of this kind of deformation, we need to develop new quantities. So, we said the change in length divided by original length is normal strain. Change in the original rectangle, we called it as shear strain, okay. And uh, you know, we have also seen it in uh, Cartesian coordinates, we have also seen it in polar coordinates and then we have looked at uh, how by using Taylor's approximation, these quantities can be written. So, we have seen uh, parallelly epsilon x x is dou u by dou x and epsilon r is dou u by dou r, epsilon y y is dou u by dou y and I said whenever you have a theta, you will have 1 by r, but you should know how to remember this u by r, okay. And similarly, you have gamma x y, the opposite uh, differentials. Whenever you have theta, you have 1 by r. This you can write, these two terms you can write, that the third term minus v by r, you have to know. And you also have what is known as rotation. See, in fact, in, when we moved to bending, we saw this rotation. It all comes from the uh, displacement quantities, gradients of the displacements used suitably. And we have also noted a very interesting relationship between the displacement gradient, strain and rotation. When you have small deformation, this can be put as sum, that is sum of a strain tensor and a rotation tensor, okay. And uh, we have also looked at, uh, this is called infinitesimal strain because we were looking at small deformation and we have looked at infinitesimal strain, okay. And you also have similar to more circle of stress, you have more circle of strain, the principles are same. Only thing is you have to put gamma by 2. I said whether you like it or not, people have developed many concepts using the shear strain as gamma, but tensorially only epsilon xy transforms. So, when you write it as a tensor, you write it in terms of epsilon xy. When you do certain other discussion, we do it in terms of gamma. The only difference is I had to put gamma by 2. Here again, every point represents what is a strain happening along that direction. And the greatest advantage in the case of isotropic material is the principal planes of strain and principal planes of stress are identical. That makes our life enormously simple. And uh, you know, we have also looked at uh, um, what is the expression for the same expression like what you have got for the um, principal stress, you also have this for principal strain, okay. And we have also looked at finite strain components. And we have said that the literature say that these are the quantities are exact. These become necessary when we want to go for large deformation. 
and this has been developed by several people Koshi, Almansai and you have green tensor and you have this uh, in metal forming because we started strain by looking at the formation of GN pin which is what is used in the IC engine. Here you see the deformation so visibly that deformation you see visibly it is large deformation only finite strain can help and other applications the, the future is biomechanics okay in rubber like materials recoverable elastic strain deformation is very large requiring the use of finite strains and I have shown uh, use of photoelasticity for epidural injection and uh, you have this needle is inserted uh, deep into your skin. So, how the uh, stresses are developed if you want to mathematically analyze you need to go for the finite strain quantities and we have also looked at the use of uh, DIC along with uh, tensile testing machine for you to get the data and you can also get uh, true stress and true strain. Yeah, now when you have the simple tension test there are many many things we have looked at the elastic behavior, we have looked at proportional limit, we have looked at elastic limit and yielding is very prominent in the case of mild steel you have a peak and then it drops immediately and we have looked at the usable range is very very small and we said that this is about 0.2 percent strain all that is very important ok. So, this is how you have the uh, material fractures and uh, we have also looked at uh, what happens uh, when I plot the same graph for ductile material with different percentage of strain all your material models can be seen elastic perfectly plastic and then bilinear elastic and then elastic and strain hardening all these are captured in the data. When you look at, at the strain levels that we want to work these are applicable and uh, in contrast what you find is in the case of brittle materials the tensile and compressive strengths are largely different they are very strong in compression very weak in tension and also the strain levels what they can reach maximum are also considerably small compared to ductile materials. And the other important aspect is if I do not have a clear depiction of uh, your uh, yield strength the way to do is you have at 0.2 percent strain you draw a line parallel to the original uh, slope and then find out where it hits and you take that as the yield strength this is a accepted practice ok. And when you have unloading, unloading will happen only here when you reach this uh, uh, plasticity ok. So, you have elastic limit and proportional limit all this is uh, illustrated in this and in a ductile material if it yields we say that it is uh, yielding and we have also looked at for brittle material how the failure happens and you are in a position to do that ok. We have said that this is maximum uh, tensile stress theory and ductile material it is at 45 degrees you recognize from uh, more circle. So, failure happens at 45 degrees ok that is why you have a cup and cone fracture and you have also said how to label sigma 1 and sigma 2 and uh, you know we have also learned what is a uh, uh, elastic constants. Young's modulus, we have also looked at what is a Poisson's ratio. When I say Poisson's ratio, it is a ratio of uh, minus transfer strain divided by longitudinal strain. And uh, we have also emphasized that uh, st stress is uniaxial, but strain is triaxial, ok. And we also know the standard values of Young's modulus, ok. In this class, you know, we have. Uh, looked at what is the basics with which we started because some of the topics that we have discussed are very recent probably you remember them better and the concept that we discussed earlier we had a, a bird's eye view of how the subject has been developed and uh, we work on small deformation and slender members never forget that.